Yep. yep. There's my voice. Are we on now? Good. Morning, everybody. Just gathering all my tools. And sorry, love, one last favor, maybe the actual uh, quilt, the hound's tooth pattern. The hound's tooth pattern's not there. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Sparrow Quilt Company Stash Buster Series. My name is Brady Sparrow, and today you're going to keep me company while I start building this awesome quilt behind me. It is called Almost Hound's Tooth, and... Um, Sorry, I got distracted by my own voice. If you have not already downloaded the pattern, then you are going to visit sparrowquiltco.com. You're going to click on my face, and that'll take you to a new page where you can enter your email address, and we'll reply with an email with the pattern attached. So this one that you see here is my original Almost Hound's Tooth quilt, and I made that one out of uh, a bunch of Tula Pinks and a bunch of Michael Miller fabrics that I had in my stash. And I've had that one up on the wall on display here at the shop for good couple of years uh, I don't know I don't know and I had the um, lovely Kathleen Riggins quilt that for me down out of Camrose you may have heard of her she's Kathleen quilts online go follow her blog she teaches all kinds of um, really great free motion uh, and long arming tips and tricks and so then last week I had Sheila here at the shop start up this almost hound's tooth quilt with all these beautiful rose gold fabrics from the yes please line by riley blake and i might like that one even better and we did it with this tiny dot um riley blake background fabric oh, it's awesome it's so awesome i'm really really happy with it so good morning everybody i hope your weather is better where you are we have got uh, gray and foggy and minus 20 here today in edmonton alberta canada but that's par for the course. That's what we get for living where we do. Uh, tell me where you're watching from and what your weather is like where you are. You huddle up inside, quilting like I am? Hopefully the answer is yes. It's always the ideal situation when we are uh, struck with this cold weather in uh, this time of year. Oh, it's February now, guys. So happy Groundhog Day. We have got a little man in the uh, family celebrating his ninth birthday today so Ziggy I know you're not watching but happy birthday little farmer we will be having hot dogs and potato chips for dinner at the request of the birthday boy <laughs> not mom's first choice let's just put it that way <laughs> so yes our little Ziggy many of you have been following us online since Ziggy was born so it'll be hard for you guys to believe that that little man is already nine years old Stash Buster Series, what is it? Why are we doing this? This is an effort to help people use up their stash. I personally have been very motivated by my own Stash Buster Series, pulled out yet another bundle of fabric that I've been hoarding for way too long, some fabric that I got from the quilt patch, Shelly Wicks in uh, Moose Jaw. She and Jeannie Large used to own a quilt shop called the Quilt Patch. They've since retired, and Shelly Wicks is now running... Uh, half yard quilting studio out of her backyard where she does long arming on some beautiful APQS machines. But anyways, that's where I got this little black dress fabric. Mm, I'm going to estimate seven or eight years ago. So I know to some of you that's not very old fabric, but for me, that's pretty ancient. I busted it out last night and started another new project. So that's something else you guys can look forward to coming very soon. Um, we'll be giving away some goodies a little bit later, so make sure that you're sharing this video with all your friends on Facebook here. If you're not familiar how to do that, just look under the video. You'll see like, comment, and share. Just go ahead and click that share button, and uh, that will tell everybody in your Facebook feed what you're up to today. All right. You guys ready to get started on this fun block? Let's do it. Elle, have we got the screen split? Okay. So here uh, you can see... My first hound's tooth block, almost hound's tooth block. I just love these little uh, ostriches. They are just really fabulous. I wish I could dress like that every day. But in order to make this block that you see here, we are going to need a five inch of print, a five inch of background, a four and a half inch square of print, 
and also a four and a half inch square of background. And then we're also going to need a couple little two and a half inch squares of background fabric. Oh gosh, okay, there, there's two of them. All right, so fairly simple, fairly straightforward. For now, we're going to start with our five inch in both print and background fabric. We're gonna set aside our four and a halfs and our two and a halfs for now. I'm going to show you two different ways today to do half square triangle blocks. The first is just our typical traditional way of doing a half square triangle block where we're going to mark a line down the center on the diagonal. And I'll do that on my background fabric. I find it much easier to see on the lighter fabric. So you can see I've just drawn a line on the diagonal from tip to tip. And I am using my ideal seam guide. I've still got my uh, plastic layer on the back. I use this all the time because it's just nice and light and it's easy to move this one around. So I use this for marking all the time, but I'll show you a bit later how I'm gonna use it for a different method of half square triangles. Then what I'm going to do is place that with the right sides facing on my print block. And now I'm gonna take it over to my machine and I'm going to sew a quarter inch seam on this side and I'm also going to sew a quarter inch seam on this side. And then I'll split them apart and that will give me two half square triangles. All right, so we'll take this over to the machine and Landon, my little producer here was so smart. She said, do you want a second chair? So now I can just hop back and forth between the two. Now, right now, I have got my quarter inch foot on my machine and I'm lining that up with the line that I marked on the back of my fabric. Okay, so there's one side. Landon, may I please have an ergonomic rotary cutter? And you all know how I like to trim my threads as I go. Oops. Yes, I sure do, honey, thank you. Thank you so much. We'll need that in a moment. So now I have, are we still split on the screen here? Okay. Can you see that? So you can see how I've sewn a quarter inch away. Now I'm gonna go to the other side and I will sew a second seam on the other side of that marked line. And this is probably just the quickest, easiest method for doing half square triangles. There is a lot of marking involved though, I do have to say. Good, trim, 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 trim our threads away. All right, so, now I have got my two seams sewn, and are we still split? Good. Now I'm just gonna lay those out, and I'm going to use my seam guide for this job. It's thick enough to cut up against. And I'll just zip up between those two stitching lines. And then when I open it up, I have got two squares that are half print and half background fabric. So now I'm going to take those over and press them. I got my handy dandy little uh, roundabout turntable thing here. So this is a really great little system that I like to keep handy when I am stitching and sewing. It's got a turntable base, like it's like a record player base and then the two different options for the tops are a pressing mat and a cutting mat. So it's a really versatile little system. And this is really good to take to a retreat or to a class or something like that because you've got the different options. You don't need a full size um, cutting area. All right. Pardon me for just a second, guys. I'm just gonna grab a ruler.
you know, it seems like I'm opening one of these every single time. That's okay. I'll take this one home. So this is um, my six inch squaring ruler. And uh, I always, always, always square my blocks before I put them together in a quilt. You've got an open one? <laughs> it's only a little bit open. Thank you, Landon. Awesome. I appreciate that, honey. Now, what I love about these rulers is they come with this um, sandpaper slip stop. And you've heard me talk about this stuff on my six inch strip cutting ruler before. It's this sandpaper sticky and I put it on the back of the rulers so that they don't shuffle or move around. And it makes a big, big difference, like a shocking difference. I was trimming some blocks up at home just using my regular ruler and I had no sandpaper on the back. And I found it shuffling around all the time. I really have come to rely on this sandpaper on the back. So I highly recommend it, these rulers with the slip stop on the back. But getting back to my point about squaring the blocks, you will find that your quilts come together much better if you've squared up all your blocks. What happens is you piece up all these blocks, 64 of them in this quilt, and one of them ends up measuring, just for the sake of argument, 8.25, and the next one is, you know, 8 and... Not quite eight and a half, but a little bit less than eight and a half, but definitely more than eight point two five. So if you sew all those together, what ends up happening is you get this like excess fabric in your quilt and things don't quite line up the way they should. And you end up losing points and things just don't look accurate anymore. So I highly, highly recommend investing the time to square up all your blocks before you stitch them all together. So in this situation, we've got... 64 hounds tooth blocks and there's two of these in each block so we're looking at squaring up 128 of these but i personally feel it's worth it it is worth it to get the precision and the results that you are after i mean we are not giving this fabric away right we want to treat it as good as we can and we want to get the best quality project that we can so that's what i'm going to do now the um squaring ruler itself has these 45 degree angle lines. So I actually line that up with my seam that is down my block and then uh, I do all my trimming from there. So I'm putting my two ones up in the corner. Hopefully you can see well enough here. This is my one inch marking and this is my one inch marking and there's my 45 degree angle line. So I'm going to place this over my block and I'm lining up that diagonal. And it grips really well because of that slip stop that I was bragging about. <laughs> I did try to slide it. <laughs> Didn't work. Hopefully my big fat head's not in the way. Okay, so I am looking to square this to be a four and a half inch block. So when I look here, I've got a little bit, just like a thread's worth of fabric hanging off here and hanging off there. And when I look at my four and a half inch mark underneath the ruler, I've also got some hanging off. So I'm going to be taking off just a strand off all four sides and that's going to get me a nice square block. And my diagonal line is hopefully going to go corner to corner and just be really precise. I prefer to cut my half square triangles a little bit larger and then trim them down so that I get that level of precision that I'm after because I'm fussy. If I cut them bang on, then sometimes they're not quite right or they're twisted just a little bit. And then I find myself having to fudge a little bit. And um, if I just piece them a little bit larger and trim them down, then I get better results and I like that. So, uh, you know, why fight with yourself? Just do it right the first time. Okay. Yes, that's a good point, Elle. Landon's pointing out that I could have used my rotating cutting mat, um, and it is actually perfect for squaring things like this. So I'll try and show you that in just a bit here. So see how nice and square that edge is there? Are we still on a split screen? Good. I just love that. So now this edge, I'm going to line up with my four and a half inch markings on my ruler. And I'm going to make sure that this is also lined up with my seam, my diagonal seam down the middle.
There we go. And I'm not losing a lot. Like, it's literally just a hair that I'm trimming off. But it's so worth it. It truly does make a difference. Now, normally I don't... I don't cut sitting down, but this ergonomic cutter makes it so that I can sit cutting down, and that's a good thing. We don't always have to be standing, hunched over. So there you can see my block is very nice and square. My seam goes on the diagonal from corner to corner, and I'm happy with that. So I'm going to set that aside for a moment, and we'll do another one here. Sometimes I'll even use this diagonal line on my cutting mat and just line it up there to make sure that it's nice and square. Depends what I have available to me at the moment. Have we got any questions or anything yet, Elle? Nothing, eh? You guys are being quiet today? So I recently had a quilt come in and I have to piece the backing um, with the diagonal seam. It's uh, a fireside backing and the quilt is wider than 60 inches. So I need to piece that seam, that backing in order to make it large enough for the quilt. And I was pondering maybe doing it uh, live here on the uh, show for you guys. So if you're interested in seeing how we do that diagonal seam when you're working with a um, 60 inch fabric, please leave me a comment. We'll take a little vote. If I get say 20 of you that are interested, then on Monday we'll include that in the show. And that is how to piece your backing with the diagonal seam. We talked about that, well, I think last week and uh, Terry Rowland was kind enough to remind me that it was the John Flynn method of piecing a backing on the diagonal, and she was correct. Ginny Beyer has taken John Flynn's method and made up this little uh, worksheet where you can work out the um, measurements and the yardage that you'll need. So between the two of them, they've really come up with a great system on how to piece that backing. Mm hmm Yeah, <laughs> well, space consuming, that's for sure. We'll need probably a good 90 inches of fabric for that. Okay, so again, I have lined up my four and a half inch uh, markings with the outer edge of my square. And now I'm just going to trim off these outer edges. And I'm also making sure that my 45 degree angle line is lined up with my 45 degree angle of my piecing. Yeah, you guys want to see that? Okay, so we'll do it for sure then. We will plan to have that on the show on Monday, okay? And if you guys are just joining us, then um, you need to know that we do our live stream for the Stash Buster series on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and that's at 10.30 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. And we go for about 90 minutes, and... Um, we just like to share free patterns and tips and tricks. And really, you're just keeping me company while I make my way through quilts. And uh, I'll just chatter my way through it and show you how I do it. And hopefully, you'll learn something. And we like to give away prizes, too. So that's always fun. So I'm going to be giving away one of my squaring rulers today. And I'm going to be giving away an ideal seam guide today. So how do you guys qualify for that you're going to share this video with all your Facebook friends and I hope that you know how to do that but just in case right below the video on the right hand side you're going to see a little button that says share you're just going to click that and that will share the video with all your friends okay now I better keep up with my coffee so I don't run out of energy got a long day ahead now that we have pieced those, the next step is going to be bringing back these little two and a half inch squares. So I am going to, those are in here. So we wanna make sure that we put those on the print fabric, but first we have to mark those just like we did the other ones. So I'm going to lay my ruler out and I want you to watch carefully. Is, is the screen split there, Al? When I lay this out, I don't put my ruler point to point 
and draw the line beside because then it's slightly off center. I lay my ruler out so that I can see my two tips and sometimes I'll even bring over the tip of my pen and make sure that I can touch that corner. And hopefully you can see it here in this camera well. If I can touch that corner, then I know I can draw a line that's precisely from corner to corner rather than slightly off center to the right. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, please do leave a comment. But you can see there how I've pieced, how I've marked it right from corner to corner, whereas if my ruler was corner to corner, my line would be slightly over here to the right. So I have to mark a second one as well. And then I can do my sewing again. There we go. And so I am going to place these like this and I'm going to sew directly on that line and then we'll cut off whatever is outside of that line in the corner. And if you are very frugal, then you can save all those little dog ears and maybe make a bunch of little mini half square triangles of your own. Create a cute little mini quilt or a pillow or something to go with your almost hound's tooth. Um, if you want them, I'll send you mine too because I'm not doing nothing with them. Ain't nobody got time for that. Okay. So I'll line that up nice and square and I just want to make sure that that outer corner is lined up well with the, bra the fabric underneath it. That's how I'm going to get the best results. I'm stitching right on the line that I've marked, yes. Stitching right on that line this time, not to the side of it. I had to double check there, you made me question myself. There we go. So now I can trim those. So here's what we're left with now, two of these. Now I'm going to trim a quarter inch outside of that line. So I'm going to use my little uh, six inch ruler for this job. I'm lining up that quarter inch and I will just trim away that outer little dog ear. So the products that I'm using today I've got my ergonomic rotary cutter and that is definitely a different um, handle than you're used to seeing. This rotary cutter is um, great because I can use it sitting down and it's also great because it puts a lot less wear and tear on my hand and on my wrist. Um, I was using my other rotary cutter again this morning and this part of my hand right here just started to throb because I was pushing down so hard. It doesn't take long for us to get back into those uh, old habits when we're using um, our other equipment. But with this one, you're pushing more through the palm versus pushing down when you do with, say, your typical rotary cutter handle. And um, I just, I really love it. It has got a great little safety mechanism and... Um, I like that I can use it sitting down because it does take its toll on you standing to cut out a quilt, especially if it's a larger one. Now for um, marking pens, I am just using a Clover water erasable marker today. So because of the way this project works, I'm not going to have to go back and erase those. But uh, if you were using them, say, to mark quilting designs, the better option might be like an air erasable pen because then you could just let it fade away on its own if you're going to be quilting it that day. Air erasable tends to uh, leave the building within about 24 hours, so you'll only want to mark what you're quilting right now. These types of pens, they're going to stay until you physically erase them, say with a damp Q-tip 
or there are pens that you can purchase that also will take out these markings. I'm not worried about that today. They're just going to stay in my quilt. All right. So put this over here. This is now what I'm going to do is I'm going to press this again and it is going to be uh, towards my print. And Alberta is asking, is there a left-handed rotary cutter? Yes, there is, Alberta. So instead of having a red handle, the left-handers have a blue handle. And those are the same price on the website. Sometimes it looks funny with the conversion from Canadian to American, but they are the same price. So if you have any questions, please just ask. So I'm just going to set my seam first. And then I'll open that up so that my seam goes towards the print. Press that really good. Bring over the second one. I don't have any problem piling my ironing on top of the last bit that I've pressed because it makes that bottom piece pressed even flatter. It just gives it a bit more reinforcement, a bit more um, flattening out. And that is a good thing. All right, so those have turned out really well. Those are going to be my little legs of my hound's tooth. And now I'm all ready to put this block together. Isn't that quick? It's not going to take us long at all, is it? So now I'm going to bring back my four and a half inch print. So now I've got my four and a half inch background and my four and a half inch print. I'm going to sew this little leg to this and I'm going to sew this little leg to my background and then I'll have two little rows that I can join next. So let's take those over to the machine. I told you guys before that I really like to sew with my seams on top. So when I bring this to my machine, I will feed it in like this with my print on the bottom and my seams up so that I can make sure those both stay pointing towards the print. Now at this point, if I was concerned with accuracy, I could certainly bring in my little um, five inch seam guide and I could place that on the bed of my machine because I'm going to be back and forth between different uh, jobs today. I'm going to leave that off. but. Say if you did some assembly line piecing, you did all your half square triangles first, and then you created all your blocks next, where you were only doing one type of sewing again and again and again, then it would be a great idea to apply this. But I am going to be back and forth between tasks, so I don't want to be putting it on and taking it off. Now, the edge of my foot has caught my seam there, so I'm just going to stop sewing lift my presser foot, let that seam lay back down, and I'm going to continue sewing. And sometimes you'll find when you've got a seam that's coming um, out the corner of a block, when it gets under the presser foot, sometimes you'll notice that it kind of kicks out to the side. So I am very careful to hold it straight and still from the left-hand side, and sometimes I'll even bring over a pin or what's called an awl, that's A-W-L. It's just a long, slender, um, sharp point tool. And I'll just hold things straight so that my seam line doesn't go straight, 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 and then kick out to the side like this or kick out to the right like that. I want my seam to stay straight right to the end of my sewing. Now, if anybody's just joining us, this is our uh, Stash Busters series. And today we are working on the almost Hound's Tooth quilt, which you can see on display behind me here. If you've not yet gotten your pattern, then you are going to visit sparrowquiltco.com and you are going to just click on my face there on the front page and you will be able to enter your email address and we'll send you an email with the pattern attached. We've also created some kits. You can go to the... Um, website at sparrowquiltco.com and you can pick your fabric so you can do the curiosities line like I am you can choose the yes please line like Sheila did or you can choose from any of our other beautiful fabric lines and we'll put that kit together for you and send it to you in the mail is there anything more fun 
than getting your fabric purchases in the mail. Okay, so again, my seam is catching. I'm just gonna raise my presser foot and then drop it back down. There we go. Okay, I just took my time walking over that last little bit because it was trying to push just like I told you it would. Those diagonal seams at the corners there, they can be, they can be trouble. So this time I am going to press towards my background fabric and I'm going to press towards my print. So I will have a seam pressed towards the lighter fabric here, but that's what's going to give me a nice uh, nesting and make sure that my center of my block lines up really well. So first I set that seam and then I'm going to open it up, pressing it towards the white background fabric. And this one, I'm going to set the seam on my print side and then press the seam towards my print. This Curiosities line by Riley Blake is designed by Amanda Herring and it is so pretty. I love the colors, I love the prints. I love everything about it. What have I done wrong? Oh, there, mm, there we go, okay. <laughs> Phew, I was scared for a second there but you guys know <laughs> I mess up stuff all the time. So now I'm going to bring this over on top here and I'm gonna sew along the middle there. And I forgot to grab my fork pins, but of course I would like to make sure you can see the bottom, the seam is going to the left and on the top, the seam is going to the right. So this middle seam is gonna line up so nice. It's called nesting and it just reduces any bulk that's in your seam. I'm still interested to try Kathy Strassen's method of twirling her seams. Did you guys get to see the trunk show with Kathy on Wednesday? Boy, we had fun. Ah. So you can tell what my favorite fabric is right now. What's your favorite fabric right now? Have you got a line that you've got your eye on? Maybe you've already shopped for it. Maybe you're just uh, waiting for it to land at your local quilt shop. What's your favorite line of fabric right now? We're so lucky these days with social media and um, just the internet in general, but all the fabric manufacturers, they're talking ahead of time about their upcoming lines and what's new and what's coming out soon and we're so lucky to be able to see all that information and plan uh, our stash building ahead of time to see what uh, little quilty indulgences we must must have it's so fun shopping for the store and when people come in and they compliment our variety of fabrics I like take it as a personal compliment because <laughs> I pick them all they're all my favorites but it's so exciting to me to see that uh, people actually enjoy what I'm choosing and that they come here for the fun fabrics. Okay, so I've sewn that last seam on this block. Looked funny for a second there. Needed closer inspection. Okay. So, remember I told you how I like to sew with my seams up? This time, I had to sew with one seam down. Look what's happened to it. Can we see it there on the screen, Elle? It's flipped. So now both of my seams are pointing in the same direction. It has flipped, and I've got more bulk on this side. It's not the end of the world. I'm probably not going to do anything about it, but this is exactly what I was talking about when I advised sewing with your seams up. And so next time I'll just have to pay a bit more attention and make sure that that stays in the direction it's supposed to go. And it's a good reason to get out our fork pins because that doesn't happen to me when I use them. Uh, I think I put them away in the drawer over there. If you don't mind, Landon. I'm so lucky to have an assistant who grabs all the things that my fruit fly brain forgets. Check the over there L under the pantographs. Okay, so that is lovely. It is beautiful. I'm very, very happy with it. 
there is a view of the full block for you. You can see it's not tough. It's very, very simple. And we will get through this quilt in no time at all. I chose a couple of different fabrics to work on today so that it wouldn't just be the same one over and over again. Oh, thank you. So fork pins. For those of you who didn't get to see those last time I used them, it is a U-shaped pin. Is this screen going? Okay, good. Are you just keeping it on? Good, okay. Okay, so it's a U-shaped pin, and when I put it into my project, I put it on either side of the seam, and that just makes everything stay in place, and it pulls those intersections together really, really effectively, and it avoids trouble like that. But I'll also show you, I really like my seams to line up well. Those aren't quite touching, but let's just pretend they are. I'm not going to put this one in the show anyways. This one's purely for me or for the shop, whatever. All right. So, Ooh, okay. So now we're going to take a survey, take a, a, a poll of sorts. What is your favorite solid type of fabric? Uh, currently, our options are Riley Blake solids or Moda Bella solids. There's more than that. There's also Konas. Um, another one that we tried recently was Waverly, and I really liked that one. Um, I'm not familiar with any of the other brands, but share with us in the comments what your favorite type of solid is. Okay, so we're going to move on to another block. And I'm just going to gather all my ingredients so that I have myself organized. To make each one of these blocks, we'll do a 5-inch print and a 5-inch background, a 4.5-inch print and a 4.5-inch background, and 2 times 2.5-inch. Two now, today I am using a Riley Blake uh, white solid. And I got to tell you, it's significant. It's a nice weight. It's got a slightly silky feel. I really, really like the Riley Blake solids. They are uh, beautiful to work with. So for now, I'll set aside my four and a halves. And I am going to just use my fives. Set those there. Now, if you haven't got the pattern yet, you're going to visit sparrowquiltco.com. And you will be able to find... Um, SparrowCoco.com, you'll see my face there on the front page. You're going to click on my face, enter your email address, and we will send you a reply email with the pattern attached. If you've heard about our prior quilt, which was called Stay Centered, it is a log cabin style quilt, you can visit the Stash Busters page at SparrowQuiltCo.com, and you'll be able to find all the prior videos that we did on that quilt, right from cutting the fabrics off the bolt all the way to the machine binding that I did at the end. And you can also visit us on YouTube, where I hope you will subscribe to our channel. And please visit us on our Facebook page and like the Sparrow Quilt Co. business page. We are always sharing um, tips and tricks and tutorials and funny things that have happened around the shop. So it's always entertaining to follow. Kona Armoda. Hmm. Perhaps not. And, you know, I got to admit, the Riley Blakes are a bit more expensive. I, I can't lie. The, their prints are $20 a meter here in Canada, and their solids are $20 per meter. And But it's worth it. It really is worth it. You have to keep in mind that you get what you pay for, right? And I think it's that way with anything in life. Okay, so now I have marked my line down the center of my 5-inch square on the diagonal, and I am going to put it right sides facing with the 5-inch print square underneath it. And now I'm going to take that over to the machine, and I'm going to sew her up. Now, don't forget, guys, we'll be giving away some prizes a little bit later, so make sure that you share the video. You're just going to use that share link that's directly below the video, and you will be entered in the draw for a, one of our 6-inch um, squaring rulers and one of our 15-inch ideal seam guides. Someone's piecing the Stay Centered Club. Awesome. Just finished it? Yay! I hope that you'll send us pictures of your finished Stay Centered quilts. Um, 
we love seeing them, all the different colorways that people came up with and just um, everybody does it differently. Everybody does it their own way, so I love seeing that. Okay, so what are we getting for favorite fabric lines? Anybody sharing those? Ooh. Lots of batik lovers out there, hey? <laughs> so many of our local shops carry batiks. I don't carry any currently, but um, I carry lots of Riley Blake and Moda, that's for sure. Okay, so I have sewn on both sides of my diagonal line. Now I'm just going to cut directly on that marked line. Ooh, Kansas Trouble, yes. That was one of my earliest indulgences. We made a giant quilt out of Kansas Trouble. Holy moly. <laughs> I don't even have that darn quilt anymore now that I think about it. It was probably one of the first that we ever loaded on a long arm and we practiced all our feathers on it. <laughs> Room for improvement is how I'm going to leave that. So I'm using <laughs> my ideal seam guide to uh, do my cutting here. It's not typically used as a cutting ruler, but um, I, I just find it such a nice lightweight ruler. I use it often and for as many things as I possibly can. And in a moment here, I'm going to show you another method of doing half square triangles that is going to use this ruler instead of a diagonal line. So now we're looking at pressing again. And I'm just going to set that seam, press open. Now, some of you have heard me say before that this is pressing. It's not ironing. When we iron and move the iron back and forth like this, things twist and they don't lay flat. And I actually just did that on the corner there. That's what reminded me as I moved the iron around, it twisted that seam on me. And I don't want it to twist. I want it to be nice and flat. So remember to use more of a lift and press, lift and press versus uh, coasting or, you know, moving back and forth on the surface of your fabric. Now, my iron today is the Oliso uh, Pro, and it has got little legs. So when I sit it down, it raises up on those legs to uh, raise the heated surface off of my uh, ironing board. And it is really handy. I, I love it. I use it all the time. It saves that um, rotation of your wrist. That can take its uh, toll on you because we're usually using a heavier iron when we are quilting and um, to lift it and rotate it like that constantly it just starts to hurt after a bit. So that seam is good and set. Now I'm going to square these little guys up. And so we're back to our uh, blue squaring ruler and I'm going to put my one inch markings up in my top right corner and I'm going to line up my uh, 45 degree angle line with my seam that's through the center of my little block here. And I'm just going to take a little shred of
We're back We're again. again. We lost, lost you for a minute there. Not sure, Not sure if the internet just went to uh, slow or what happened there, but we are back and we are still trimming up blocks. And I'm just using my little six inch squaring ruler. I wanna make sure that these blocks are four and a half inches square. I started with five inch. When I piece them together and make the half square triangles, they come out about four and five eighths. And I want four and a half, so I have to take off an eighth and just make it so that it all fits together beautifully. And I know a lot of people will say to me, Brady, that's 128 blocks that I'm going to have to square up. And it's your personal choice. If you don't want to square them, don't square them. Do what you want. It's your quilt. I think it's worth the time to do it. I wasn't happy with how that was laying there. I almost cut and it wasn't quite, wasn't quite right. There we go. That looks better now. So I'll just go ahead and trim off those two sides and then I'm going to flip the block. Four and a half. Line up that diagonal. Just scoot this down a little bit so that the corners are lined up well. There we go. Ella is asking, is the blue ruler easy to view? Yes, it absolutely is. Yeah, I have no trouble seeing through here. Even with that darker gray fabric, I can see right through. Okay, so now we're going to mark these little two and a half inch squares. We're going to put the line from corner to corner on the diagonal. Now those um, squaring up rulers, you can get them as small as four inches. And I think we will mail up to 10. They come larger than 10, but I can't ship them. They're really awkward and I don't have a box that size. So if you're local to us here in Edmonton, you can come in and get up to 24 inch squaring rulers. Now this pen I'm using today is kind of a thicker point. I honestly prefer kind of a finer tip pen just in life in general. Um, but like I showed you how I move that ruler over so that uh, I can see the tips that accommodates for the thickness of my pen. If I had a finer pen, I could probably have my ruler over just a little bit more. But I really do prefer the finer lines. So now we are going to put these little white squares in the outer corner of our print. And I'm going to sew this time directly on that line. Okay, take these over. We'll be done this before you know it, and then we'll trim those outer corners off. But make sure it's lined up nice and square to that outer corner before you stitch it. I mean, we always have to rip stitches at some point in every project, but the less you have to do that, the better. You got a question there? Oh, when would I iron? I prefer to iron at every step. So, um, oh, 
Maybe just on clothing, like when I'm doing clothing and I've got maybe just a large open area, I might iron, but I rare, even when I'm pressing clothing, I'm usually pressing because I don't like how the iron kind of grabs and makes things fold on top of themselves. It creates little wrinkles in the fabric. So I am more of a lift and press, lift and press, even when I'm doing clothing. It might just be that I'm so well trained from quilting that I can't get over that, but I find I just get better results if I lift and press versus actual ironing. So I'm not going to use this for my quarter inch. I'm going to use my blue ruler and I'm just going to line up my quarter inch marking line with my seam that I've sewn and I'm going to trim away a quarter inch away from the seam line. There we go. And number two. So we'll finish off this block and then I'm going to show you that other method of doing half square triangles using my ideal seam guide. All right, so again, I am going to put my print fabric on top. I'm going to set that seam and then I'm going to open it up. What are you laughing about? We have a question here. Alberta says, do you chain piece your blocks or do I prefer to complete each block? No, I am typically more of a chain piecer. Um, now I'm just trying to do the repetition of the uh, block instructions so that in case late, blue, late joiners can catch all the steps. But I would normally do all my half square triangles, cut them all apart, press them all. And I feel like I get things done faster it might be an illusion, but that is my preference. I'm, I'm more of an assembly line type sewer, I guess. And there we're pressing to the darker print, which I usually try to do. There's the occasional time when you have to press towards the lighter fabric, but sometimes it cannot be avoided. So now I'm ready to bring back in my four and a half inch uh, background fabric and my four and a half inch print. I'm going to join these two, sew up the middle, join these two, sew up the middle, and then I'll join my two uh, little rows together. And again, I'm going to put my solid fabric on the bottom. Hmm, this seam, so Lannan's just asking me, could I maybe press them this way instead? But either way, if I press towards this seam, it doesn't lay very flat. It still wants to kick. So I always press towards my solid fabric where possible because when we turn it over, and I'll show you after I actually sew this, you'll see that it wants to go towards the solid fabric. These seams push it that direction. So when I was first learning to quilt, I was taught to, pre if, if the instructions of the pattern do not tell you which direction to press, then press towards the direction that your seams are trying to go. Let them go in that direction where there is release of sorts. Okay, so what's my opinion on open seams? I try not to do it. However, I just did an entire diamond quilt and it all has open seams, all pressed open. It's not my favorite because I'm concerned that those open seams, all that's holding that together is just the thread between them. When we press our seams towards one side, there's a bit of security in that it's folded over um, and it just seems a little stronger to me. All of that said, I've never had open seams pop apart or become an issue for me. It's just an issue in my own little head that I've come up with that is a concern. So I don't want to do these wrong now that I've been rambling. With my fruit fly brain, that's okay. It's good to address it when it comes up. Okay, so I'm going to sew along this side and I've got my seams up so that I cannot twist them or turn them the wrong direction.
There we go. And now this one can come over too. I'm really, really bad for mixing up the order of things. So I lit it. This part I have to do one step at a time because the fruit fly brain just doesn't pay enough attention. I have to do it one step at a time. Mm -hmm. It's catching on that diagonal seam again. So like I said, I just lift the presser foot a little bit, let that seam lay back down, and then I continue on with my sewing. <laughs> Someone said if they get interrupted, they'll put a seam or a pin in the seam that they need to sew next. I think that is so smart. Anything that can help me stay on track is a good thing. I get going in eight different directions and I need something to get me back to my focus. Okay, so that one I did press towards the light background fabric. Oh, I was going to show you guys this. Okay. So when I open this up, see how the seam just naturally wants to go towards the solid fabric? These seams here are pushing it that direction. So why fight that? I could try and press it this way, but there's more bulk over here and it's not gonna want to stay on that side. So it makes sense to me to press it over here where it naturally just wants to go. Okay, any questions on that? Please leave us a comment there. All right, so these are now two little rows that we're going to join together. And this time I'm going to use my fork pins so that I get uh, my seams the way I want them. Catherine is asking, what machine am I using and what's my favorite? So today I'm using a Sparrow 20, and I really like these little Sparrow machines. Um, the company is called Eversewn, and they have launched a full line of sewing machines. And we brought in the Sparrow 15, Sparrow 20, and Sparrow 25. And I've got my eye on the Sparrow 30 as soon as those are back in stock. I'll be ordering those too. And I've got the little tables coming for them and also the big extension table that goes around them so that I can show you guys how to do the free motion quilting and stuff like that on these smaller machines because... Not everybody has a big fancy quilting sewing machine, so... Um, I love these machines because they're lightweight, they're easy to use, they're good for a beginner. There's all kinds of great things about these machines, and they're sturdy. We saw one at the Houston Quilt Show. They had removed all the plastic outer parts. Everything inside is metal, so you can count on it being really well made and lasting a long time. When you've got metal on metal parts, it just has longer a longer life. So this machine at Houston was set up with the exterior removed and just all day long it was sewing on a circular piece of denim and that denim just went around and around and around and around. They are amazing machines. They work really, really well all day long. What's my favorite? I don't really have a favorite. I own a Janome 6500. It was the first machine that I ever bought for myself. It's a workhorse. I will never get rid of it. I love it. I also own a brother... VQ3000. I love that machine too. Um, it's got a lot more electronics and sometimes it's a bit more finicky. So um, while it was very, it's a higher end machine, sometimes those electronics are a bit of a pain in the butt. These simple little um, just mechanical machines are great, although it does have a computerized display telling you what stitch it's on. But they're just so simple. Like nothing can go wrong on these machines because they're just simple. And to be perfectly honest, when I first bought my Janome 6500, I was looking at a simple mechanical ma machine like this versus the 6500. And I went with the bigger one because it came with the table, it came with the rolling case, and it came with a million different stitches. Do you know how many of those stitches I've ever used? Honestly, take a guess. Like three? Yeah. <laughs> I use that straight stitch all the time. And I've maybe used the zigzag a couple of times. And just for kicks, I've tried a couple of the different um, fancy or embroidery type stitches. All I needed was a straight stitch, honestly. So if you are just starting out, 
you don't need that big fancy machine. You don't. Don't break the bank trying to afford it. The difference between the Sparrow models? Uh, just off the top of my head. So the 15 is very mechanical and it's got no digitized or computerized display. I believe it has got a, a pull-out vertical bobbin. Like the bobbin goes in with an actual bobbin case, whereas the 20 and the 25 are a drop-in bobbin. Uh, I don't know anything about the 30 yet because I don't have it in my possession, so I haven't been able to study up on it. The 15 is just basic. It's more simple, less stitches, um, and very mechanical. The 20 and the 25, both of those can drop their feed dogs. Both of them have the removable arm, as does the 15. Um, and just the more stitches available on these bigger machines. The 25 has an actual computerized display and it's you know it shows what your stitch length is what stitch you're on it gives you a bit more information whereas this one just has a little digitized display it says zero one which tells me that I am just on the basic stitch and at least the 20 and the 25 have speed variable speed so I can turn it way down for if my you know youngest wee girl is stitching or I can turn it way up for myself when I am sewing like a speed demon. So they're all fairly straightforward machines, but they just have more stitches as the um, price goes up. And a few other features like the dropping the feed dogs and that sort of thing you can't do on the 15, but you can on the two bigger ones. I hope that helps. Hmm? Oh, great. Okay. So Matt's giving you guys some descriptions there that will help. Um, give you more facts aside from my uh, random rambling. Okay, so I'm trying to show you here my two different seams. We've got the one on the bottom facing the left and this top one is facing the right. So I'm just holding it apart a little bit so you can see how my uh, two seams are intersecting there. And then I'm just going to take my fork pin and I'm going to place it on either side of that stitching line. I'm going to go in and back out. And now I'm going to sew along this line. And I just slow down when I get here so that I can walk over my, my pin because I'm not going to pull it out at the last minute and allow things to shift around. I sew over pins all the time. But I do it carefully and nice and slow. Again, I, when I'm starting here, I've got a diagonal seam that's coming right into the corner. So I usually will start by just dropping, like, uh, dropping my needle. And then that gives my machine a grip on the fabric, like it's got its little claws into it. And now, because of that seam, remember I told you how it can kick or push the seam in a direction that you don't want it to? I just go one stitch at a time, and then it just moves things along slowly but straight because if I start really fast it does that kick and now I can't repair that I have to take it out and re-sew it so if I just take my time with these diagonals at the corner then I get a better result you're probably just thinking I'm picky and crazy but It's not the end of the world. So there I was just walking over my pin, nice and slow. Now I'm coming up to those seams on the underside, so I'm just going to flip it over, make sure that they're both facing the direction I want them to, and I'm holding it in place from above to make sure that it does not flip again. And piss me off later. Ooh, sorry, guys. Keep it G-rated, Brady. Okay, let's see. Did I make it happen? Did anything flip? No, yay. So that one turned out good. No issues in that one. I'll show you both sides. There is the one that was on the bottom. There is the one that's on top. All my seams 
are going the direction they were intended to go and we are doing well. We'll just press this block open. Press this block flat. There we go. And this final pressing I am doing towards the um, larger print block that's up in the corner of the uh, hound's tooth there. All right. So now you can see we have got a collection and they are turning out really good. I love, love, love this fabric. It's so pretty. All right. So if you happen to just be joining us, this is the Stash Buster series and my name is Brady. If you are interested in downloading this almost hound's tooth pattern that you see on display here behind me, you're gonna visit my website, sparrowquiltco.com. You're gonna click on my face enter your email address and you will receive an email in return with the pattern attached and then you can follow along in all the fun of piecing this really great quilt. Uh, what am I after here? Okay. So now we're going to work with these pretty little rosebuds. Those are my four and a halves. And I also need a set of five inch squares. Good. And I also need two by two and a half. So there they are. Okay. Now this one we're going to do a little bit different. We're going to set aside our four and a halfs for a moment. We're going to set aside our two and a halfs for a moment. This time what I'm going to do is use my ideal seam guide. And I'm going to actually um, remove this layer off the back. This layer of plastic. And so now that is sticky. It's like a rubberized adhesive sticker on the back of that. And what I'm going to do is with the flat side, not this one with the cutout, I'm going to lay it. Mm, yep, make sure I got it right. I'm going to lay it corner to corner on my white block. Yes, yes, I'm doing this correctly. Sorry, I just had a fruit fly moment there, questioning myself. So that's now attached. That's actually right on there. And now I'm going to layer it over this other block. Now, unfortunately, I had the children dig out some white Elmer school glue last night, and I was in fully intending to bring it in here today. What I should have done, and I'll show you on here, Ahead of time, I could have put a little dot of white glue here and a little dot of white glue here and I would have layered this up and I would have just pressed on my glue dots and I would have let that kind of dry. And then when I go to put my seam guide on here, when I pick it up, the downside to this is that I leave my pink fabric behind. So Today I'm just going to be holding it in place well, but for future if you go to do this you're going to put a little bit of glue there at each corner and that's going to hold these two fabrics to each other making this job really nice and easy for you. If that does not make sense please leave a comment there and I will do my best to address it. So I'm going to line these up, make sure that they're good and square, <laughs> landed laughing at me you guys. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so now this time you can see I did no marking. I didn't mark anything. And I'm going to put my seam guide on the inside and I've got my quarter inch foot on here. And I'm just going to sew up the center here. I would suggest adding a second square so that your seam guide doesn't attach itself to your sewing machine. I'm not putting the iron back right, guys. Okay, good. So now that I've sewn that, I am going to lift the guide 
and I'm going to turn it around. So then this time, I'm going to be sewing on this side of my guide. There we go. Now this time it'll be easier because I've already sewn that first seam, so I won't have to worry too much about my layers falling apart. But this is another quick, easy way that you can do your half square triangles without having to mark every single one of them because, I don't know, that gets to you after a while. Your eye starts to twitch and you start to hate what you're doing and it's just not fun anymore. So this is a nice, quick way that you can still get that precision without having to mark every single square. Okay, so then I can remove that. Now, I don't have a line this time to do my cutting on, so I'm just going to cut from corner to corner because that's where my line would have been anyways, and that's still going to work just fine. Hmm? The seam guide. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Hal. So Lannan says just leave it on there because it's already in place. It won't slip won't give you any trouble it'll just be exactly where it needs to be so okay so the good thing about this being physically attached is that nothing sways I don't know about you but when I make my cuts sometimes things move around so because that is actually um, stuck on there nothing can move around or Shuffle. Oh, when I'm sewing as well, yes. Okay, so now I'm going to press those. And again, we're pressing towards that print fabric. Roberta is asking, will the glue gum up your needle? I've never had any issues with it, Roberta, um, for this specific... Uh, task. I've had lots of times where, say, like Fusible Web has gummed up my needle, and you can usually tell when that's happening. Like it's descending into your fabric, and as it comes out of your fabric, it's pulling the fabric up with it, or you can hear kind of a the 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 like a, a dull sounding pop. I just change my needle more frequently when I do start to notice that type of behavior out of my machine and my needle. Okay. Pardon? Yes. All right, so now what I would like to do is show you how I'm going to use this um, roundabout system to square my blocks. You saw me doing that already, um, squaring up my little blocks, and how I had to lift it and physically turn it each time I did my cut. So this time using my roundabout table, I won't have to lift it and turn it. I'll be able to just spin it. So we'll set this aside for a moment and we'll bring the roundabout base over here. Thank you, Miss Landon. Wanna check our camera and make sure they can see what I'm up to. Yes, they can. Okay, so the nice thing about this uh, cutting mat as well is that it's it literally designed for squaring blocks, so it appears to me. My blocks are going to be four and a half, so um, I'm going to try and kind of center it. And I like these 45 degree angle um, lines right on my cutting mat. I like to line up my seam with those, and I can see that I'm fairly on track. Next, I'm going to bring over my little ruler. And again, I've got my one inch markings out in my right hand corner. And I'm going to line this up over. So I've got my 45 degree angle line running from corner to corner. And I've got my four and a half lined up out here. And then I can just trim away these little dog ears. 
trim anything up there. Not much this time. I must have been fat with my quarter inch there. Ah! So, Landon just says, you're not using your roundabout. This is a whole darn idea of what I was doing. So, I've just cut these two here. Now, instead of lifting my block, I'm going to turn the whole table. Good thing I was planning to show that to you. Hey, guys. Thank you, Landon, for keeping me on track. Fruit fly brain. See? You see it in action and you believe it. All right. So, I have done my little twirl of my cutting mat. And I'm back at the four and a half inch lines. My diagonal is running straight through the center, and I'm going to trim off that dog ear. There it goes. All right. So let's do that one more time the proper way and see if I can get it right this time. Okay? So I've got my seam lined up with that diagonal 45 degree line. I am going to line up the 45 degree line on my ruler with my diagonal seam and I'm just going to trim away the excess, put that back in place and spin the whole cutting mat. Now the benefit to not lifting your block is that, well, you're not lifting your block. Things are just staying uh, a bit more accurate. You'll really notice a difference in like larger pieces if you don't have to uh, lift them and reposition them. Sometimes if I'm doing a whole bunch of cutting and I'm cutting out of strips, if I lift those strips and they're layered, they shuffle around a little bit. So it, the benefit of just spinning the whole piece without lifting it, um, there, there really is a benefit to uh, not lifting your fabric. Keeps you more accurate. All right, so one more little dog ear to trim away there. And that little block is done. I need these back. All right, how are we doing for time, Miss L? 11.51? Perfect. All right, Miss Landon is going to choose a couple of winners for us. I'm going to be giving away a 6-inch squaring ruler and a 15-inch ideal seam guide. And hopefully you shared this video so that you are entered into the draw. If you forgot to share, then remember for next time, join us again on Monday at 10.30. We'll be coming back to the Stash Buster series. Hopefully I'll make a dent in sewing some of these blocks over the weekend. If not, we'll just continue sewing. But I'm also going to take a little bit of time and show you guys how to piece a minky backing with a diagonal seam. So I have a quilt that is uh, 70 inches square, and I want to put a minky backing on it. So minky is only 60 inches wide. So with the normal method of piecing a backing, I'm going to have to cut two pieces of minky that are 75 inches, and I'm going to sew those together with a horizontal seam. Then I would have a backing that is 75 by 120 for a quilt that's only 70 inches square. So instead of um, cutting 150 inches of minky, which is expensive, let's be honest here, um, I can probably cut about 90 to 100 inches of minky. So I'm saving myself almost a meter and a half of purchasing minky. Uh, and then I am going to use probably almost all of that minky versus having a big chunk left over in my closet. And of course, we're stash busting, so we're always pulling out and using what we have on hand. But why do it that expensive way? I'm going to teach you how to piece your backing on the diagonal so that you can be more frugal when you're purchasing those expensive um, Lux backings. All right, Elie, have you got a winner for me? So, First winner is going to win the six inch strip or six inch squaring ruler, and that is going to Colleen Pittman. Hi, Colleen, thanks for watching today. And the winner of the 15 inch seam guide is Charlotte. Oh, Charlotte, I'm sorry, Owsley. Owsley, I hope I'm saying that right. O U S L E Y. So, both of you girls, Colleen and Charlotte, would you please send us a private message here on Facebook? You're going to include your email address, your phone number, and your shipping address, and we are going to get these prizes in the mail to you. Okay? Guys, 
Let's see you on Monday at 1030. And don't forget that we stream Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with our Stash Buster series. And that is 1030 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. If you have missed this video, then go check it out on the Facebook page. You'll find us also on YouTube. And you can visit the website sparrowquiltco.com. Look for the Stash Busters link and you'll find all the videos that we have done so far this year in our efforts to use up our stash and help you use what you've got. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. We'll see you guys on Monday. Take care and have a great weekend.